Hello, this is Botany 101. My name is Angela Nishimoto. Now, if you remember, last time we started talking about human nutrition. We went into the macronutrients, right? The carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fats that we need in our diet in large quantity. And we also started talking about some micronutrients, specifically uh, the vitamins, yep. Yeah? Okay, so today, okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna continue with human nutrition, all right, and then we're gonna start a new topic and hopefully finish it, which is called the origins of agriculture, all right? So for today, our objectives, we're gonna cover some more deficiency diseases, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit about eating for health, if that's possible, of course it is, but still, okay? We're also gonna talk about early humans, you know, having been, as far as we know, hunters and gatherers, and about the evolution of agriculture, and then we're gonna do a survey of different kinds of domesticated plants. We're gonna also add in some animals as well, all right? So for one thing, vitamins. Remember, vitamins are one classification or one group of micronutrients, and vitamins okay, are actually organic compounds, yeah? So last time we talked about uh, lipid soluble, okay, uh, different kinds of vitamins, and today we're gonna go into the water soluble types a little bit. We're just doing a survey because you could actually do a whole series of lectures, you know, dozens of them, okay, on vitamins, all right? But still, we're gonna try to do a little bit Right? So the ones we're focusing on, the water-soluble vitamins, have to do with those okay, that, that generally can be uh, provided by plants, as well as some that can only be provided by animals. And the first group we're gonna go into, of course, is vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, okay? Here's a chemical structure, okay, or a, 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 sort of like a three-dimensional ball and stick model, okay, of vitamin C, ascorbic acid. And how do you get them? from fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, so this is a good topic, yeah? So fresh fruit and vegetables. So these, of course, are fruits and they're also vegetables. You have pumpkin, you have different kind of tomatoes, you have a different other kind of gourds and et cetera. So legally, these are vegetables, even though uh, botanically they're fruits, okay? So you can use any kind of fruits and vegetables and these are excellent sources of vitamin C. Other sources include animal sources, such as organ meat. So here, looks like we have a liver, probably a sheep's liver. And here, it looks like we, uh, we have some gizzards, yeah, from um, um, some kind of bird, yeah, probably a fowl, duck, duck gizzard or chicken gizzard. So these are also good sources of vitamin C, okay? Now, why is vitamin C important? For one thing, it's important in terms of making of a protein known as collagen, okay? What is collagen? Collagen is like cellular cement. It actually helps anchor one cell to another, okay? And if, you know, and if you don't have this, okay, uh, you can have some very bad ramifications on your health. This is also part of the matrices, you know, or the uh, stuff in which, you know, cells of bones and teeth and cartilage are embedded. Okay, so those are the matrices of these formations. They also have to do with elasticity, okay, of the blood vessels, the ability for it to uh, contract and, you know, release, you know, so it can actually be elastic. It can go from one form, can be stretched, and then come back together again, as well as the elasticity of your skin. So I guess that has to do with your um, epithelial cells, okay? Another thing about vitamin C, it also is an antioxidant. If you remember last time, we talked about antioxidants. So antioxidants uh, are substances that uh, kind of prevent or kind of head off oxidation. Remember that we talked about the uh, peroxide, we also talked about the superoxide radical. Yeah, this can actually damage cells and lead to aging, okay, as well as cell death as well, okay? Another thing that vitamin C is useful for, for sure, it's a requirement, is that it helps in the absorption of iron, and of course iron you know, helps to build your blood, right? It's a, a component of hemoglobin, yeah, which, uh, which is a molecule that helps to get oxygen gas and carry it to various parts of your body to allow cellular respiration to happen, okay? Another thing that vitamin C has a hand in, so to speak, is in the production of hormones. Of course, another thing that is very important. And if you have a deficiency, you, have, you get something called scurvy. Did you know that way back when people were sailing on ships, oftentimes sailors, you know, this was practically the last results, resorts for them, yeah? 
because being on a ship and sailing the world was it an adventure, but it was also very dangerous. And did you know that maybe about uh, your books tells you this in that your textbook uh, that maybe up to two thirds of the men on a ship could expect to die of scurvy, okay, which was a result of the deficiency of vitamin C. So you can see here this poor person here with all all this uh, teeth problems, gum problems. Okay, so some of the symptoms that can result from scurvy include uh, bleeding gums, okay, bleeding gums, and etc. Uh, so we have uh, something called scurvy, bleeding gums, and they can actually even have internal bleeding, kind of mega bleeding. So fairly recently, like in the 1960s, 1950s in the 1960s, there was this man named Linus Pauling. Do you remember Linus Pauling? I don't know if we talked about him before, but he was one of the main people you know, in the race to find out the structure of DNA. He was a competitor with Watson and Crick. Okay? So well, Linus Pauling also did another thing. He actually figured out the alpha helical structure. Remember the alpha helix is one of the second levels of protein structure of proteins. Very brilliant man. And he was very famously you know, a professor at Caltech. One of, the, uh, one of the big science places in the United States. So Linus Pauling had the idea. He published a rather controversial paper about uh, people taking mega doses of vitamin C. Okay, so generally, sort of like the recommended sort of uh, um, allowances for vitamin C is about 60 milligrams. But he recommended okay, that maybe people take 2,000 to 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C per day. So remember, vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin, right? So what happens is that the vitamin C, whether you take it as a supplement or you're taking it in as food, such as uh, the uh, vegetables and fruits that we talked about a little earlier, what that'll do is that it'll actually not stay in your body. Generally, it will be excreted from your body in, uh, 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 if you take more than you need, okay? So if you, even if you do take mega doses of this vitamin C, generally, pe most people say that it shouldn't be able to hurt you even though some people can, can maybe say that maybe it can. So maybe uh, taking these large doses of vitamin C, should it, can it prevent colds and other kinds of infections from viruses? Because of course the common cold results from a viral infection, okay? Furthermore, maybe vitamin C might be bactericidal, okay? It might be able to kill bacteria, maybe bad bacteria for, sure, for uh, example. Also maybe as a way to uh, prevent or cure cancer. Okay, because remember, vitamin C is considered to be an antioxidant. And oxidation, when it happens in your body, pretty much what happens is you have these um, free radicals that are, that, is, that are missing electrons and they're stealing electrons from your cells. Another thing that can happen when you have oxidation happening in your body, it can actually damage DNA. And when you have DNA changing, that's called a mutation, and some mutations can result in cancer. Okay, so it's like a whole domino effect, all right? Okay, so then, okay, so that pretty much wraps up what we want to know about vitamin C. Next, we also have the B vitamins, okay? So they're uh, what they call the vitamin B complex, and they're uh, a series of eight vitamins, again, okay, and one of their main function is as coenzymes. They are necessarily, they're necessarily in the cell, okay, to allow enzymes to do their work. And remember that all the different kind of biochemical events that happen in your body are mediated and facilitated by different kinds of coenzymes and by enzymes, okay? So they're necessary for enzymes to have their effect, okay? Now, okay, the three that we're gonna talk about briefly are thiamine, okay, also known as vitamin uh, B1, niacin, and also B12, okay? The reason we're talking about these particular uh, types of B vitamins is that they generally are deficient in plant-based foods on the whole, okay? That doesn't include things like legumes and things, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, thiamine is also known as vitamin B1, and here's a structure of it right here, okay? Now, if you have a vitamin B1 deficiency, this is something that was, that was pretty widespread in Asia in the earlier part of the 20th century, okay? Because thiamine, vitamin B1, is instrumental in the breakdown of carbohydrates during cellular respiration before the Krebs cycle. Okay, that allows for the breakdown of uh, the sugar molecule. Okay, so by the time it's act after glycolysis, before it goes into the Krebs cycle, you have the breakdown of this. Okay, so remember, you only have a two carbon um, molecule that goes into the Krebs cycle, and then furthermore, that is completely broken down during the second part of cellular respiration, known as the Krebs cycle. Okay. 
So if you have a deficiency of the thymine, so this is essential okay, for respiration in your body, aerobic respiration. If you have a deficiency, okay, you could expect fatigue, okay, depression as well, emotional depression, psychological depression, psychiatric depression, confusion, because a lot of these B vitamins all have to do with uh, conductivity and uh, conducting nerve impulses okay, in your nervous system cells. Okay, confusion, you can't think straight, you get confused, also cramping, okay, burning and numbness in your legs, edema as well, and it can actually lead to an enlarged heart, eventually leading to death. And this is some, a syndrome known as beriberi. Very common, say, in Asia, you know, in the earlier part of the 20th century, when people relied on white rice, because white rice, okay, is actually has its bran stripped off it and also is polished, and so it's very refined sort of starch. So a lot of the B vitamins that is inherent in rice would be actually lost when you process it more, okay? So here we have another example of when you have uh, processed foods, you lose a lot of the nutrients in it, okay? So they say, the Japanese army during World War II, I guess, that they say maybe up to what, 40%, 25 to 40% of the men in the Japanese army had this beriberi condition, and it can actually kill you because you can have massive you know heart congestion and heart failure okay leading from that because remember this has to do with um, um, uh, uh, absorption of nutrients okay so then we also have sources of this vitamin b1 okay including meats okay pork especially liver especially whole grains okay like we just talked about seeds and nuts and legumes all right so here we have meats all right meats it sort of looks um, I don't know, if you have a good association with meats, it look good. And here you have liver again, sheep's liver, okay? And here we have whole grain, okay, a whole grain kernel or whole grain fruit. And here we have some seeds of sunflower, okay? We also have nuts as well, all right? And of course here we have some lentils, which is a legume, all right? Okay, next we're gonna talk about um, niacin. Okay, niacin uh, in either form, nicotinic acid or nicotinamide, you can see that the two chemical structures are very similar to each other, all right? All right, and this, of course, niacin is important because it is used to make, okay, nicotinamide dinucleotide, okay, NAD plus, and nic nicotinamide dinucleotide phosphate right, which is NADP. If you remember in both uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration, you have these as electron carriers, okay? So there's very important for energetics in our bodies, okay? If you have a deficiency of niacin, what you could have is uh, you cannot get the release of energy from the food, okay? It can't go to the electron transfer system, for one thing. That can result in cell death. Okay, so this kind of syndrome is known as, okay, pellagra, but here we have the uh, um, chemical structure of NAD+, plus. okay, here you have NADP+, plus. you can see that the NADP+, plus only has like a, uh, they're very similar, that the NADP+, plus has this phosphate group here, yeah, phosphate with the oxygens and et cetera on it, okay, so these two different molecules are very similar, all right. All right, so this niacin deficiency can uh, result in what they call the four Ds, dermatitis, which is uh, inflammation of the skin, yeah, you have lesions and skin problems, dementia, which is, you know, another way to call it is madness, okay, dementia, and also diarrhea, which is very unpleasant, of course, and it can lead to death. Okay, so this lack of uh, ni uh, niacin can lead to what they call pellagra. At one point in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, a lot of the people, maybe a large proportion of people in mental institutions in the South were there due to madness, dementia, brought about, brought about by pellagra. A quite a, a large amount, and so these people generally had a diet that uh, didn't have a whole lot of meat, especially corn-based diets. Okay, it's kind of scary. Yeah, so you had all those people in the mental institutions, in, you know, committed, you know, in these uh, sanitari uh, sanitariums due to the fact that they had a vitamin deficiency. It's kind of sad because I guess people didn't know so much about it at the time. Okay, so you can get sources of this um, niacin would of course be in meat, 
okay, poultry, other kind of animal proteins such as eggs, fish, also some vegetable sort of proteins such as in nuts and seeds and legumes. Okay, so you can see nuts and berries are good things to eat, you know? It's sort of like a joke, but it's not funny if you have a vitamin deficiency. So we have these meats, including poultry and red meats. I guess these are different here. This looks like bacon, which is, of course, from pork. And here, these look like, this, these look like pieces of beef. Maybe this is pork, too. These two uh, look like beef to me, maybe even uh, lamb or mutton as well. Okay, fishes like the salmon. Salmon, of course, is a very good source of lipids, too, as we talked about before, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And then you have eggs, such as these eggs from free-range chickens. Okay, did you know, too, that when you have brown eggs, as far as I could tell, you actually come from brown or reddish hens, yeah? And the white ones come from white ones, white hens, yeah? I think it has to do with the pigmentation that happens to be in the chicken, all right? Okay, so here we have nuts, and we have seeds, and we have lentils, once again, another good source of, um, of this uh, niacin, okay? Then we also have vitamin B12, also known as cobalamin, all right? And here's a structure. You can see it's quite complicated, and you can see that it also has all these carbons. So vitamins generally have organic structure. Vitamins organic are organic molecules, all right? So we have cobalamin. And generally, this is not in plant-based foods, okay? So if you have a deficiency of this vitamin B12, you can get pernicious anemia. There's a whole other bunch of syndromes that you can get, including fatigue and weakness, okay, numbness in the lower limbs as well. And this vitamin B12 uh, uh, deficiency sometimes happens in people as they, get, as they age and get older. Because what they say, pretty much a paradigm of what people believe, is that as we get older, you know, our bodies aren't able to absorb nutrients as much as possible. So because it's vitamin B12, you can't actually take it orally generally. So if you have a B, B, vitamin B12 deficiency, you can actually go get vitamin B12 shots. Okay, from uh, uh, doctors who have that, you know, osteopaths or MDs, okay, so they can pretty much give you uh, uh, vitamin supplementation. So they're thinking, too, that many diseases might be partly due to vitamin deficiencies, okay? So that's something that's kind of serious. Okay, next we're going to talk about minerals, okay? Minerals okay, are inorganic substances, inorganic micronutrients that we need for our body to function in a normal way. Now, what, the, what we call major minerals are those that you need uh, more than 100 milligrams per day, okay? And these include, you know, this is a little bit hard to see, but this is also in your textbook. It includes calcium and phosphorus, sulfur, potassium. So these are the major nutrients that you need, okay? Uh, uh, let's see, sodium, uh, magnesium, all right? Furthermore, okay, you also have micronutrients, and they're needed in smaller amounts per day. And these would be called the trace minerals, and they include iron and a whole bunch of other ones too. If you go to a naturopathic doctor, sometimes what they'll do is they'll take a hair sample from you, like from the back of your neck. Some, you know, if you have long hair or if you're female, everybody's kind of fussy about their hair. So they usually take a little sample from the back of your head, they'll send it to a lab, and what they'll do is they'll analyze your, uh, your sample of your hair to see what kind of nutrients you have too much of or some other kind of indicators of health because sometimes you might have high copper, low zinc, or what they'll do is they actually measure proportions of different nutrients that you either need or maybe have too much of, okay? That's a good way. I think that it costs maybe a, uh, more than $100 to do it, but if you're into nutrition and if you have certain disorders, that one of the, one of the things you want is a balance, okay, in terms of different kinds of things. So sometimes if you have a, a deficiency in sulfur, you know, which is pretty important for protein productions and et cetera, okay, they might uh, tell you to maybe take more egg yolk, to eat more eggs and other good, rich sources of sulfur in your diet. So it can be useful, okay? If, you have, uh, if, you, if you're able to go get a hair sample analysis. Okay, so naturopathic doctors and maybe osteopaths might do that. Okay, alrighty. So major minerals. The one we're gonna go into has, happens to be calcium. So this is something that is very important, of course. All these different nutrients are, of course, very important for normal functioning of your body. Right? Calcium, most of the calcium that you take in is deposited in, in bones and teeth. Remember that we talked about last time that you actually uh, build and uh, break down bone all the time. Okay? So you have bones, uh, uh, bones and teeth as where you have most of your calcium and also phosphorus deposited as well. Okay? Now another thing about this too, you also have a, a level in your blood. K2, 
calcium in your blood as well, but a very small amount of calcium in your body is in the blood. Only about 1% is in your blood and tissues, okay? Another thing too, okay, that, that um, so here you have blood and tissue. So you have red blood cells here, okay, over here. You have some white blood cells here too, okay? And you also have, uh, these are cells, okay, and tissues. There's an image that we could find for that. Okay, another thing about um, uh, some of these minerals, such as calcium, it's a cofactor. So what is a cofactor? It's like a coenzyme. It's a substance, in this case an inorganic substance, that uh, can be used by your body to help facilitate the actions of enzymes in your body. All right? Now, if you have a calcium deficiency, so this is one thing that women of a certain age, if you're getting to be in perimenopause or in menopause, especially after menopause, which happens when you're, you're, you're not anymore reproductively able to have children. Okay, that's sort of like a conundrum. Anyway, so if you have a deficiency, that can lead to something called osteoporosis. Okay, osteo has to do with bone porosis. Literally means pores or holes in it. So what can happen is you can get all these um, like uh, uh, open spaces in your bone. All right, and that can lead to fractures. All right, so if you're a female who's in your 40s or getting into your 50s or into your 60s, and you're going through menopause, one of the things they say is to make sure you have supplementation. Okay, of calcium. Also make sure you do weight-bearing exercise because what you're going to do, you're going to build up your muscle, you're going to build up your bone, okay? And if you build up your bone, less likely that you'll have fractures. People, women who are postmenopausal, they have a, uh, and, and, and if you, you have a balance problems, you can actually fall down and break your hip. And, and this is something, a fracture that is common among women who have osteoporosis. Not only that, in places like your wrists as well, where the bone can thin and you have this porous bone there, you can actually be susceptible to fractures. Of course, it's painful, but another thing too, that they say that if you have a broken hip, you know, you know, your mom or yourself or your grandma, you know, people in your family, your aunties who are going through menopause, if you fracture a hip, they say that it statistically increases your chance of dying, you know, within the next couple of years if you fracture your hip. So this is pretty important things, you know. All of us, we all want to live nice long lives, but all of us also want to live nice, long, healthy lives as well because old age is no fun if you're in pain all the time, okay? So if you take care of your body now, Okay, you take care, you make sure you take or you have enough vitamins and supplements in your diet. Okay, eat a variety of food, which we'll get into later. Okay, you'll be, a, you'll be healthier okay, as you get older, all right? And if you're old age and you're healthy, this is a happy time of life because people find out, uh, psycho psychologists and stuff, they find out that people tend to be happier as they get older. Okay, when people are very young adults, there's a lot of that romance of being discontented all the time, you know? That's sort of like the psychological state of, of the artist, in a way. Somebody who's not satisfied with everyday reality, and that's sort of like romanticism, you know? But as people get older, they get happier, okay? Now, sources of calcium include, of course, milk products. You know, milk products are just loaded with calcium. Also, dark leafy greens, such as spinach. But I guess spinach, you need to actually cook a little bit to free up the calcium so you can take it into your body because the calcium in some of the leafy greens are not in a form that your body can absorb, okay? Seeds are also another good source of calcium, dietary calcium. So here's this fellow milking this cow for all he's worth, traditional method. This looks like it might be in Ireland or in England. Look at the little cap he has on. We also have these seeds, sunflower seeds once again. This looks like watercress, okay? Watercress too, very good source of uh, calcium from vegetable matter, but they say that a lot of the calcium in watercress, you actually need to cook it a little bit to free up or uh, change it into a form that your body can use, okay? Now, trace minerals, so here's that same little chart that we have in your textbook. Okay, the ones we're gonna go into, okay, are gonna be, I guess, iron for one thing, a little bit, and we're also get, gonna get into um, uh, uh, iodine. Where is it? Let's see, here it is. Okay, iodine, right there, okay? All right, so iron, okay, it's a component of this extremely important molecule in your body, in your red blood cells, in your erythrocytes, called hemoglobin. As you can see here, this hemoglobin molecule has four polypeptides, remember? And remember, the, when you have different polypeptides making up a protein, that's the fourth level 
a protein structure, so hemoglobin molecule. Another interesting thing about hemoglobin is that the structure, you know, of, of the heme group, you know, the one with the iron in the center of it, yeah, uh, that's actually very close to the, the uh, chemical structure of chlorophyll. Isn't that amazing? You have two different molecules, you know, for two sort of different purposes. They're very similar, except uh, the chlorophyll molecule, instead of having iron in the center, actually has uh, mag magnesium. Okay, magnesium in the center. Now another thing is that hemoglobin is responsible for your red blood cells coloring your blood red because uh, it a actually has that iron, which you know in its oxidized state is red, just like the red soils of the middle of Oahu. Yeah, the red the red soils of the Eva Plain. It's it's red that way because of the iron in it, the iron content. And when iron, what happens with iron when it oxidizes? It turns red, right? It kind of rusts, right? So uh, your blood is red because of that, because of the uh, iron iron uh, 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 atom in the hemoglobin molecule, okay? Alrighty, so if you have a deficiency in iron, what you can end up with is something called iron deficiency anemia. That makes sense, yeah? So uh, uh, in, uh, instead of pernicious anemia, which, which results in you know, uh, deformed red blood cells, you can actually have anemia, okay, or not as many red blood cells due to the fact that you don't have iron enough to, to make the hemoglobin molecule. Okay, sources of iron include meats, organ meats, like, like you remember maybe when some people of a certain generation, remember when your mom would cook liver maybe once a month or once a week and you'd be forced to eat it? Some people don't like liver and other organ meats because they're very strong tasting. But if you have a taste for strong tasting foods, you know, you really like, like liver and I, I sort of remember myself. For me, you know, my own personal taste is for me, liver was a treat, you know, because my mom didn't like to make liver very often. She didn't make liver at all. Usually the time when I got to eat liver was when she was cooking the Thanksgiving turkey you know, or like turkey during holiday time. And then for me, what would, I, what would I do? I would actually get the liver, you know, and the gizzards and all those other organ meats, and I would kind of, you know, we usually put it in foil, put a little uh, olive oil or before that butter on it, and salt and pepper it, you know, whatever else kind of spices you put on it. And then for me, that was a treat. So I usually was the one in my family to eat the organ meats and would share it with our dogs or with the cats, you know, depending on what kind of pets that we had at a particular time. So for me, I really like organ meats, even though some people, oh, you know, they don't like the taste of it and they, they think it's kind of gross, you know? But I myself, I like organ meats. That's just my particular taste, okay? Shellfish as well, such as these mussels. These look like mussels. We have fish, okay? We have liver and then we have the, that gizzards again, okay? Good source, okay, of iron, all right? We also have things like, um, let's see, dark leafy vegetables, okay? Dried fruits as well, a good source of iron. Did you know if you have dried apricots, raisins, pr uh, prunes, which I guess is dried plums, right? And those are really a also a good source of iron, okay? Legumes as well, so here, one of the themes that we've been seeing is legumes, very good to eat, okay, if you wanna have a vegetable-based diet, right? Legumes, which you're gonna go into in a later chapter, Okay, and also we have the whole grains as well, breads that have been enriched with iron. So usually you have iron uh, uh, enriched flours, okay, like white flour has enriched, enriched with iron and other su some such like that. We also have cereals, you know, like some, some of the sugary cereals have, have actually been enriched, okay, with iron. Okay, so here you have the leafy greens. In this case, it's, it looks like watercress again. Here we have the lentils once more. So lentils, you know, different kinds of beans. Very, very good to eat, very good to eat. Okay, especially in combination with grains. Okay, beans and grains, very good source of proteins and other sorts of things. And here you can see that they're also a good source of minerals as well, okay? All right, now uh, another trace mineral. So this is um, the iodine that we talked about. And the reason why we're talking about this iodine, okay, is that it is important and it can have some kinds of implication. Now iodine is necessarily for regulating uh, hormones that are produced by your thyroid gland, okay? So your thyroid gland is like a little butterfly-shaped structure here that is kind of right over your throat, right over your vo voice box. Okay, and then on top of that, you have the parathyroid. Okay, paro just means on the side. It's like a paramour. It's sort of like a lover on the side, you know, sort of like that if you're, if uh, when you think about the, uh, the history of that. So para means on the side, okay? Anyway, so you have the thyroid gland, and that is necessary because your thyroid gland regulates your metabolism, okay? And what is your metabolism? If you remember the definition of metabolism, that is all the different kinds of chemical reactions going on in your body. 
Okay, so this is like one, one uh, all your glands are necessary, but this is very important, okay? Very important, your thyroid, okay? Alrighty, uh, so people can be hypothyroid, where their thyroid uh, functions lower than is normal. You have hyperthyroid, okay? So that actually does regulate your body's metabolism, the way you use fuel, burn fuel, and etc. Okay, so if you have a thyroid deficiency, what can happen? Just like this poor lady over here, you know, she, obviously she's suffering. What can happen is that if you have a deficiency in iodine, your thyroid doesn't function. It doesn't actually put out the thyroid hormones that are necessary to run your metabolism. So what happens? Your thyroid gland enlarges, okay, because it's vainly trying to produce more thyroid. So this is a lady, it looks like she might be from hill country, maybe we can assume in Asia, because, you know, even though we in the, in our, you know, in the United States and in Europe and in other, you know, what they call first world countries, we tend to have iodized salt. They actually add iodine to, or they have iodine in salt, so we get ample amounts of iodine. But people who live, especially in mountainous areas, because iodine is a constituent of the soil, but if you're in high elevation, what happens is that the iodine actually washes away from inside of the soil and goes to low level areas. This is one reason why people who live in hilly areas, especially if they don't have you know, iodized salt, they can actually get this goiter and it looks, you know, it looks horribly uncomfortable. Clearly this poor lady is suffering, you know? So, uh, and of course, another thing too, since it uh, wrecks or actually uh, kind of runs off and not allows your thyroid to function normally, what you have is you have an enlargement of the thyroid gland, so you have the swelling in the neck area, so you can see it's a deformity as well, you know? And you know, people who live in third world countries, generally a lot of them don't have access to medical care. And of course, these, these people oftentimes are poor as well. Okay? It just happens to be a, vit a, a mineral deficiency in people's diets. So how do you actually get foods from the ocean? Notoriously, all foods from the ocean, whether it's animal-based foods or if it's plant-based foods, okay? those are good sources of iodine. So here, we're lucky again that we live in Hawaii, because in Hawaii we have a good selection of seafoods, even though, of course, seafood is also very expensive. So here you have crab. You ever go to a luau or someplace like that and you have raw crab, yeah? I remember, I think, a, 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 a friend of my father's took uh, our, us kids out on a boat out in Kaneohe Bay, and he actually caught this little crab and he broke off, the leg is waving, you know, he broke off its leg and that was the first time I had raw crab. It does taste pretty good, it tastes sort of like raw fish, you know. I felt sorry for the crab with his, you know, legs waving around like that. But still, it was pretty good. And you have sea urchins, I'm not sure, you know, um, so you have the crustaceans, like crab and lobster and shrimp. You have um, sea urchins, echinoderms like this. And what do they call, people call it rana, yeah? The gonads of the sea urchin, you can eat that too. And you have here seaweeds or limu, you can eat that too. All good sources of iodine. So the best way to get your vitamins and minerals is from eating various foods, varied kind of diet, okay? And here you have sushi with fishes and different different kind. Here we've got shrimp, okay? Got uh, uh, look like eel, unagi, or other other sorts like that. Very good source. Uh, so if you need, if you if, uh, so, we get ample amounts of uh, uh, of iodine in our diets if we eat some seafood. Here it looks like we have oysters as well, raw oysters, kind of. Anyway, so good sources. Okay, now so, so what do we make of all this? Some of the things that we've been talking about. So we've been talking about deficiencies and et cetera. So a good way to balance your diet, okay? Eat a variety of foods. That's the best way, you know, through your foods to get all the nutrients you need. And so here we have all this wonderful, wonderful looking produce and vegetables at a vegetable stall. And also you have fruits as well. So doesn't that all look good? Doesn't that make you feel like you wanna eat all these things over here? Yeah? Fruits and vegetables, okay? Also some meats. Do you remember that generally a serving of meat, okay, you only need about three ounces of it. Okay, you don't, you don't need to eat an uh, eight ounce steak or a uh, one pound steak, say, uh, a 12 uh, ounce steak or anything. That's too much, okay? So one of the good ways so you can take care of your body is to, to get a variety of foods, but not too much of certain things. Remember, because meats are actually a good source of saturated fats implicated in heart disease and other, other some such like that, including even some cancers. A diet very high, especially in fatty meats, okay? There's a correlation between that Okay, eating a lot of saturated fat and cancers as well, okay? Eat whole grains, whole grains if you can, okay? Another thing is don't eat too much, 
Okay, that's another thing that if you want to remain healthy, try to control how many calories you actually take in. Okay, just kind of keep an eye on it. Doesn't mean you have to get obsessive about it and count every calorie, but if you take care of what you put into your body, uh, that you want to probably put into your body things that are good for you. Okay, you can think of foods as either good for your health or not so good for your health. Okay, another thing. Exercise, okay, this is actually good for your mental state as well as for your body. It, if you like to exercise in the morning, it's, it's a way to kind of clear the screen and get yourself ready for your work day. Another thing is if you like to work, uh, uh, work out or do your exercise in the evening, if you, uh, so we have to make time to do this. That can actually help to clear away the day and process all the different activities that you've been through, all the people that you've talked to, just sort of like psychologically, you know, very good for clearing the screen and getting you ready for the next thing, you know, very good. Like I myself, I would never do this uh, rock climbing, you know, but still, I can swim, you know, I can walk. Walking is a really good exercise, and swimming is very good if, if you have problems in your joints and other parts of your body you can't do, because uh, what you're doing is you're actually using the water as resistance, as well as uh, allowing you to float in there as well. Okay, so swimming, very good exercise for people who might not be able to do much walking or running, especially too. So running is also very good, except it is a little bit hard on your back and on your joints, you know, but still, I myself, I, I want to someday run, run a marathon, you know, so I, that's like a goal that I can work toward, you know. Okay, another thing too is you should try to increase your fruit and vegetable and whole grain intake. Increase y your food from, fu from uh, plants, plant-based foods, very good, okay. Look at that. Doesn't that look good? Doesn't it, that make you want to eat that? Look at that. All that nice, you know, uh, orange coloration, yellow color coloration. So you have flavonoids and carotenes, okay, as well as all the other things. Antioxidants, that's a good thing. If you take in a lot of antioxidants, hopefully they can stop a lot of the oxidation going on in your cells. That'll keep you younger, okay? So whole grains as well, okay? Now, balancing requirements, okay, as we continue with this. Choose fats wisely. Use a lot of, you know, monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil that you see here. That's another one, too. Choose your carbohydrates wisely as well. Whole grains, if you can possibly do it, okay? I, had a, I have a friend, you know, who uh, is from Taiwan, and I remember years ago, we, we actually lived in this house of girls all together. And I think that I, at that point, I was wanting to eat more brown rice, even though it takes longer to cook and everything like that, too. But I asked her, oh, you want some brown rice? I thought that we could eat dinner together. And she said, oh, she doesn't like uh, brown rice, because in many places, people still believe that white rice is superior to brown rice. It, it does actually taste good. White rice does, you know. It actually gives you a nice boost. But that can be bad, too, as well. You don't want to have a big boost in blood sugar, right? So uh, brown rice is actually better for you. And, plate, and people from other places, like uh, especially from Asia, still, they still have a little bit of a bias toward white rice, for sure. But still, uh, maybe things will change worldwide, and you find out you have more of the bran, more of the germ and everything in, in uh, brown rice than in white rice. So it actually doesn't allow that spiking in your blood sugar as much as white rice does. Okay, so brown rice is better. It is actually better for you. And you, you can actually learn how to cook it. It's not hard to cook. You probably, you can even you cook it in a regular rice cooker as well. It's pretty good. And when you get used to eating it, you know, I myself, I, it's a funny thing that even though I, I'm local and from Hawaii, that I, I don't care for rice that much. And even if I go and to take takeout, usually if I go to a Korean, you know, takeout place, I'll ask for a vegetarian plate without rice. So I know f for some people going away to school, one of the things they remember is, oh, they miss their mom cooking the white rice for them, you know, but still, you can actually start a new tradition in your family and eat brown rice, which is healthier for you. It also has the fiber in it. More fiber in it, move things out fast, you know, that can uh, maybe lower uh, problems for mutations in your gut, you know, in your intestines and such, your colon, you know. Okay, another thing is that hopefully, Choose and make food or make your meals not with too much salt. Try to use as little salt as possible because most food have plenty of salt in it naturally, okay? Sodium chloride, right? So try to choose and prepare foods with not that much salt. So this is a salt crystal with an X on it. Isn't that kind of neat? Yeah? Okay, so another thing, if you drink alcohol, Drink moderately, okay? No more than two glasses a day are, are the uh, alcoholic equivalent to two glasses of white wine uh, or red wine a day. But doesn't that look good? Look, at doesn't that look good? And it's from this delicious looking uh, grapes here, you know? So I can see, you know, the pleasure in wine drinking, beer drinking, 
you know, mixed drink drinking, you know, but still at the same time, if you do it in moderation, it's not bad for you. They even say that it might be good for your heart. Okay, if you drink a little bit, like one glass of red wine a, a day, that would be good. But make sure you don't actually fill the glass up, you know, to, all the way up to here. That's more like two drinks, yeah? All right, another thing is that for macronutrients, you remember the protein, carbohydrate, and fat that you take in? Okay, so you should take in maybe about 45%, maybe about half of your calories and carbohydrates, especially if you do whole grain sort of thing, okay? Maybe not as much protein as most of us eat nowadays. If you go through the drive through at the, at the different fast food restaurants, even then they're giving you way too much meat. You know, that's not, you don't need that much protein, okay? And also you wanna have some fat in your diet too. You don't wanna eliminate that totally because you do need this. You need all three, okay, to have a balanced diet. All right, now we also have alternatives, okay? You can actually go meatless, okay? Usually when they say meatless, most people consider it more like red meat, such as, uh, I guess, beef and pork, even though I know that there's an advertising campaign going on that they have something like the other white meat, and they're showing you pork, okay? But most people, uh, most people will consider pork to be like a red meat, yeah? Okay, so meatless alternatives. You can be a lacto-vegetarian. That means that you have milk products. So doesn't this look good, this nice salad? You know, and these here like chunks of cheese. They look like maybe blue cheeses. That could be quite delicious. You know, this is a really balanced meal because you have grains as well. Yeah. So the lacto vegetarians, okay, they eat milk or milk products as well as eating uh, 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 vegetables and fruits and grains. Okay. Plant-based diet with a little bit of milk and milk products. That's a good way to go. Okay. As long as you can digest milk and milk products. They say that if you have lactose intolerance, then you don't actually have lactase, which helps to break down the lactose, right, with your enzyme lactase. If you don't have that, one of the things they say might be better for you than uh, cheeses and such made from cow's milk, you can eat goat milk sort of products. Okay, that can be good too, you know. Uh, goat cheeses, feta cheese, that's delicious. It's, in it, it's one of the best things about eating Greek food and other Mediterranean and and uh, Middle Eastern diets. That doesn't that sound good? You know, a nice salad, you know? You also have lacto-ovo vegetarians. They eat milk products, okay, they eat eggs, and they also eat, you know, all the different kind of plant-based foods. That's another alternative, okay? So both of these are pretty healthy as long as you don't overdo uh, the milk products. You know, don't eat like a whole chunk of cheese. Don't eat like two pounds of cheese a day or something. That's too much. Anyway, but these are pretty good alternatives, yeah? Just as long as you're, you're not allergic to milk products. And vegans, vegans are people who are totally vegetarian. I myself have been wanting to become a vegan for probably years and years, probably over 10 years. But something, you know, people's metabolisms are different. There are some people that can really subsist entirely on vegetable kind of foods, and they don't even eat occasional chicken or fish or eggs or milk. They're like total vegans, you know? So that's something I aspire to, okay? But it's, it's always good to have a goal, you know, something that you want to eventually do with your life, you know? It's always good in your life to have goals, and that's one of my goals, to become a vegan and a good vegan cook. Now, the uh, concept of nutraceuticals, okay? Nutraceuticals sort of approaches that you actually eat foods, okay? You actually will eat foods, and you'll eat these foods with the idea to eating foods that are good for you. Sort of like, like it's a combination of nutrients and pharmaceuticals. You're eating different kinds of foods to keep yourself as healthy as you can be, okay? Anyway, so nutraceuticals, this is something that is a fairly new concept, maybe in the last 10 years, okay, where people go to the health food store, they buy as much organic foods as possible, they really look into kind of looking at their body really as a vessel that houses you know, their, their emotions and their brain. Yeah? They also look to actually giving their body good things to eat. I have to confess that myself, you know, every once in a while, I'll go to the drugstore and I'll buy like three candy bars and I'll eat that, you know? That's not good, you know, that's not good for the sugar content, but also for political reasons too, which we might talk about a little bit later in the course. But still, you know, if you eat a variety of food, if you kind of eat stuff that may be not so good for you, but you have a craving for it, if you eat a little bit of it, that's okay. I mean, like if you eat maybe a couple of candy bars, maybe one, once or twice a month, that should be all right, you know, just moderation in all things, even in vices, you know. Another thing too, eating like one candy bar every couple of weeks or something like that, uh, as long as you don't have, you know, problems with, uh, with your blood sugar problems like that, that can be okay, but it's better than, you know, getting a two, two pound box of chocolates and eating it within a week, you know, because, you know, that's kind of binge eating. That's not healthy, okay? 
Anyway, so that sort of wraps up what we want to know about the, um, the human nutrition. Our next topic that we're going to get into is we're going to talk about the origins of agriculture and early human history as far as we know what goes on because I didn't live in, as far as I know, you know, in the early history of human beings on the earth. So I can't say for sure, but we have, you know, sources, we have archaeology, we have paleontology even going even back further, you know, and we can kind of derive and infer sort of certain sort of conclusions. Okay, so that's what we're going to get into next. All right? So, so we, our, our, our species perhaps has been around for maybe about 400,000 years, okay? Our particular species, Homo sapiens, subspecies sapiens, okay? There was also probably another bunch of Homo sapiens, which I think they called Homo sapiens neanderthalis, all right? Early humans were probably hunter-gatherers. Another word for hunter-gatherers are foragers. So what did these people do, okay, the gatherers? tended to gather wild plants, plants from the wild, and some other wild plants that we now use are uh, some fruits okay, from wild plants. I think this is pawpaw, okay, which is uh, native to the Americas, to the New World. So this is actually a wild plant. I guess they call it pawpaw, and sometimes they call papaya pawpaw too, but this is actually a different species. Okay? It's supposed to be very delicious, like custard apple, sugar apple, which we don't really have that much here in Hawaii, but very, very sweet fruit it has. Dandelion greens, some people still uh, eat some of this. You can eat the greens, you can make wine, of course. Speaking of alcohol, uh, alcohol, alcohol you can make dandelion wine okay, from this plant also. Okay? So hunter-gatherers would gather wild plants, which they would have gotten most of their caloric values from, mostly wild plants, and maybe some hunted animals as well. So here's like sort of like a prehistoric uh, image okay, of uh, a, a man with a, a bow and uh, hitting uh, some kind of a ruminant, a deer or something like it, or an antelope, okay, with an arrow. Okay, so the people, early humans, are thought to have been hunter-gatherers, also known as foragers. Okay? And so uh, about 10,000 years ago, okay, this way of life, so for, from about 400,000 years ago until maybe 390,000 years ago, so about 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 years ago, okay, a lot of people all over the earth, because of course our species had actually dispersed okay, out of Africa, okay, dispersed to various corners of the globe, as if a globe could have corners. But talk about cliches. So we have hunter-gatherer eventually kind of becoming farming. Okay, farming, and this, of course, is something that we call agriculture. Okay, now let's kind of head back to hunter gatherers and people who we call hunter gatherers now, some of them. Okay, so here you see an uh, agriculturalist. This is probably in Southeast Asia somewhere. Okay, I think it's in Indonesia, maybe in uh, uh, Borneo or Java, not exactly sure, but this look, looks to me like a water buffalo. Yeah, so they, uh, here you have a domesticated animal being used to uh, till the field. Looks like they're plowing, yeah, plowing the fields, okay? Anyway, so um, foraging peoples that live now and what they eat. Okay, so some of them, some people have a meat-based diet, like the Inuit. And these people live, of course, in uh, the Arctic regions, yeah? So this is an Inuit woman, an Inuit lady, and they have a really strongly meat-based diet. Okay, they eat seals and they eat walruses and they eat whale meat, all right? Lots of fat, because here they are, way, way here in the north. It's very, very cold where these people live, okay, or have lived and lived now. Here you are around Greenland, here you have in the Arctic area, northern Canada, northern Alaska, it's very cold there, yeah? So one of the things you'll notice too is that this lady here, she has a, a round face, so maybe people who live in these regions, they have just evolved by natural selection, a lot of fat on their bodies, okay, and that kind of helps to insulate them to kind of keep them warmer. Right? Anyway, so some have a meat-based diet, like the Inuit, okay? and there are still Inuits that live in various places okay, in the Arctic regions. We have, uh, and here we have the Northern Lights. This is like one of the outstanding uh, uh, natural phenomena of the area. I, I kind of hope to see that one day. I, I hear that the sky is green and pink and just gorgeous, yeah? Okay, so, and now other peoples. Okay, tend to be more vegetarian. So you have a group of people called the Hadzabi, I believe that's how you pronounce it, and they're in Africa. Okay, they still exist now, and they eat vegetarian. Now, some of the peoples who are what they, we call foraging peoples, okay, they, they, a lot of times the modern world tries to 
mold them and, and mold them into our model, you know, how we eat. And so, but uh, there are people, native peoples, you know, who are foragers who keep to their traditional ways. So the Hadzabi, I guess, are mostly vegetarian, okay? And then also oh, here they are in Tanzania, okay, in this group uh, area here. Now we also have, and, and here is a landmark, okay, of, of that country. This is Mount Kilimanjaro, like a really uh, wonderful mountain. Look at that. In, in Africa, in, uh, not equatorial, a little bit in southern Africa, but here in southeast Africa, and here you have snow up on this mountain, okay? One of the uh, sights to see, okay, if you ever visit there. Now we actually have other people, and these are the, I'm not, I think how you say their name is Tkung, okay, Tkung, I think I'm saying it right, with this little exclamation point being like a clicking of your tongue, because they, they speak a language that has clicking sounds in it, and they're here in southern Africa, okay, kind of bo uh, in uh, all these different countries here, okay, they live in the Kalahari Desert, right, so they eat both meats and vegetables, so they have a very varied diet, okay, and these are uh, uh, people who are very healthy, okay. So what evidence do we have for these pre-agricultural societies? Well, for one thing, they have fossil evidence such as plant material being fossilized, animal material being fossil fossilized, and you has, actually have something called coprolites. So what are coprolites? Coprolites are dung or fecal matter that have been become fossilized, okay? So what do people do? Paleontologists and archaeologists, or I guess paleontologists, what they will do is they will find these coprolites, human fossilized feces, and they'll analyze it, actually pull it apart, and they'll look for uh, pollen, they'll look for plant material, they'll look for animal material, they'll look for remnants like crystals and such that are like microfossils inside these uh, fossilized fecal matter. Very important. They can really, you can actually do a lot of detective work. You can actually get coprolites also from turtles and dinosaurs and such and you can pretty much figure what, what some of them eat. Okay, that's kind of interesting. So just like, you know, so a lot of archeologists, uh, paleontologists, what they do, they kind of dig around in garbage heaps. So think about it, when we have the Waimanalo dump and other places on Oahu where we actually dump a lot of our waste products, someday, maybe just a few hundred years from now, there are gonna be people digging around in there. You know, if our, if our species survives, they're gonna be digging around in there to kind of research and make sure and confirm that we eat what we eat and also that we have used and utilized what we consume. Okay, think about that. So these now, these are actually the good old days. This is gonna be the past. You know, way in the future, this is gonna be the past. Okay, and there's that song, I think by Carly Simon, and she says, these are the good old days. That's where you can actually become a happy person when you think you're actually making the good old days now. So we might think, oh, I remember when I was a student, oh, those are the good old days, me and my friends, we did all these things, you know, but these are the good old days now, okay? The past doesn't exist and neither, neither does the future. Now, another thing that they find out is that these peoples, you know, these pre-agricultural peoples, they had a very varied um, plant diet, okay? They had lots of plants that they ate, all right? So people, including the uh, Tukung, okay, so they've actually inhabited the Kalahari Desert for the past 10,000 years. When you think about deserts, you think about dryness, you think about wasteland sort of thing, but these people are very resourceful. They've been, want, they've been in the Kalahari for at least 10,000 years. They also eat more than 100 different kinds of plants, okay, different parts of them, including, I guess, fruits, including, including root tubers, uh, stem tubers, including the greens from it, including like whole plants. So they eat more, you know, they get their plant foods from more than a hundred different plant species. Do you know in our modern diet, we tend to have like more, almost all of our calories from about 12, about a dozen different species? So think about it, what'll happen if some kind of a blight or some kind of a uh, infection happens to uh, knock down a whole bunch of uh, plants? They were, uh, even, that happened I think in the 1970s or then in the 1980s, they were only growing one kind of corn cultivar and they actually had a loss of maybe more than 25% of the corn crop a couple of years because of that, that could be disastrous, you know? So if you actually rely on more than a few plant species, the more likely you are to uh, survive. And so these people, they know not, uh, the Chukung, not only do they know how to, what, what is edible, they actually know how to harvest and find plants that you might think are inedible and then process it to get any poisons that might be in it, leached out and etc. Very ingenious. Another thing too is that plants actually comprise more than two thirds of the caloric calories in their diets. Okay, two thirds of their calories. They also rely on 50 animal species. 
okay? They have a very nutritious diet, very nutritious. So here's a man, a Chikung man, and here you can see that he has caught some kind of a fowl, like a chicken, a guinea fowl, and here he has some eggs, okay? Animal sources of protein, okay? And so these people, they consume over 2,000 kilocalories per person per day. Very nutritious diet, and they can get all, the, all their minerals and nutrients and everything that they need from their diet. Very good, and another thing too, Okay, the, uh, in many hunter-gatherers or foraging sort of peoples, generally the women are the plant people, the men are the animal people. That seems to be a divide that is pretty common, commonality you know, among many fo foragers. Okay, That makes sense yeah, when you think about it. Because women, they, they need to carry their little kids and things like that, so that would probably make them better gatherers. Okay, men can be more mobile, you know, even though I'm sure that there are uh, fathers, you know, among among foragers that would take care of kids too, but I think women, because women could be nursing their children and things like that, that seems to be more like a so-called natural ones, uh, natural division of labor, okay? Another thing, this is amazing, and it's just uh, uh, kind of galling, is that modern foragers, like the Chikung, they actually average about two and a half hours of work a week to get their food. Okay, con contrast this with our modern day where people are working 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours per week, you know, kind of, th and so what the thing is, I think, who are the wise people after all, you know? So they only need to spend maybe two and a half hours per week to find and get their food, whether they're gathering in the case of the women or hunting in the case of the men. All the rest of their time, for the rest of the week, they're talking story, you know, they're spending time with their families. So a lot of these hunter-gathering groups, they're actually very, very close-knit community. They're very close with each other, you know? They have a lot of time to actually spend on their culture. Isn't that amazing? Yeah? All right, then, so agriculture started maybe about 12,000, 11,000, 10,000 years ago. Here's a little, uh, 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 an image of a, a sickle, okay, for use for harvesting probably grain, okay? This is in the Middle East. This is like from Iraq from the Sumerian culture. So uh, this is one area where uh, they call the cradle of civilization, okay? Anyway, so about 10,000 years ago, agriculture started. So where did it start? Oh, here's a man. This man, it looks, I think this man is Egyptian, and he's a, he looks like he's a shepherd. Okay, so we had uh, people who did agriculture. You also had pastoralists who, uh, who, had, you know, who had pastures and had grazing animals that they raised for meat. So I think this man is Egyptian. And you can see crop plants in the back of him too, okay? So that, that is a man, an agriculturalist. So where did all this happen? Okay, we're gonna go right down the list. So we have the Fertile Crescent, okay? So this area, okay, in, I guess, uh, including Africa, you know, the north, north, uh, eastern part of Africa and part of West Asia, which we in the United States tend to call the Middle East or the Near East, because we were uh, working from a localized American point of view. But here, okay, so this is what they call the Fertile Crescent, okay? This is one area where agriculture began, okay? You also had, okay, the Yangtze and Yellow River Basin. So this is a yellow, uh, the Yangtze River, excuse me. Okay, and this is in East Asia, okay, a place that we call China now. And this is a photograph of uh, one part of the Yangtze River. Okay, and my, my lady friend who is from Taiwan, she and I have, a, or are hoping in the future that she and I can make a trip to China, you know, and, and go up one of the rivers. It's like a, almost like a pilgrimage. Okay, the Yangtze River, and we also have the Yellow River, another very long river. Okay, and this is a picture of the Yellow River. Okay, looking looking like you have a bunch of uh, structures there, including some modern, you know, I guess um, uh, electricity lines. Okay, we also have the New Guinea Highlands. So fairly recent evidence has shown that agriculture also sprang up in New Guinea, okay, in the high areas of New Guinea. All right, and we have Mesoamerica, okay, including uh, parts of Mexico and Central America as well another place, and also the South American highlands, all right, uh, where you have the Andes, okay, along here. Okay, all righty, and we also had another place in the eastern North America, and here's North America. This is showing, I guess, land formations, and on the eastern part of North America, you also had the uh, domestication of plants, okay, and raising plants. So, actually, so how might have this come about? 
Okay, there's two theories. I think your your textbook calls it uh, evolution. I mean, uh, revolution versus evolution. So some people believe, you know, I just have a I just thought of a broader picture of Mahatma Gandhi or Mohandas Gandhi. Yeah, just because he for sure was one of the most influential people in the last thousand years, I think. So uh, so I just even though he didn't have that much to do with agriculture, but brilliant sage idea is maybe brought about what they call an agricultural revolution. There was a brilliant person, either man or woman, not sure who, but this sage, very wise person, might have noticed about the middens. Middens are places where people dump their garbage. And in these middens, which we dig around with now, we actually find seeds and spores and pieces of plants and uh, animal bones and things like that. So maybe some way early person, some very, very wise and brilliant person, uh, saw that maybe seeds germinated in these middens. So maybe they had that leap, that leap of the brain that actually goes to a higher level where they thought maybe we could plant these seeds and then grow our crops and stay in one place instead of moving around and foraging. Okay, maybe that's one way. So they called it maybe an agricultural evolution. But since the 1960s, okay, people also had the idea Okay, of maybe there were gradual cultural evolution from one step to the next. So this is actually a schematic showing you know different kind of culture models. So you could actually have one where you have one culture developing along one stream, another culture in another, and etc., resulting in you know the, these symbols here representing from different cultures. Or you could have a gradualist model where you have one culture evolving into another culture evolving into a third. I guess um, archaeologists and anthropologists probably argue about these things all the time. Yeah? Battle of the footnotes. Yeah. Anyway, so generally too, here's a little uh, um, um, graph that shows, you know, this is a log scale. Remember we talked about log scales when we talked about pH and we talked about, did we talk about uh, 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 exponential growth? Anyway, a logarithmic scale generally from here, 10 to the 1, that's 10, 10 to the 2, that's 100, 1,000, so you have a tenfold increase, uh, 10,000, 100,000, and et cetera, from one level to the next. So you can see way life began way this long time ago, and then what you see is a, a evolution, okay, and, uh, or like a, a countdown. Okay, so live eukaryotic cells, because of course, living things were all prokaryotic before this, and then you have the extinctions, or uh, here it says expansion, you have the, uh, the mammals evolving, you have the, uh, the uh, uh, homo, homo sapiens, human ancestors walking on two feet, language, and you have a uh, 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 Homo sapiens, probably Neanderthalus, Homo sapiens sapiens, and etc., all the way to the last hundred years to the last ten years. Okay, you can see that on this continuum, you have here a, reg a regular, um, a regular slope, a negative slope. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm not saying that it's negative. I'm just mostly saying that this is just how they happen to draw this graph. So this is like the time before then. Anyway, so this is kind of interesting. Okay. Alrighty, so earliest sites of agriculture, the earliest uh, was in East Asia, and the site that they have excavated the most, uh, that as far as we know, about the earliest site is about, dates to about 11,500 years ago, okay? And then you also have the Fertile Crescent area, which has been very much excavated. It actually includes uh, the modern day Iran and Iraq, okay, Iran and Iraq, as well as Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Okay, all this whole area, what's, uh, what uh, people call the Holy Land. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Now here in the Fertile Crescent area, you have uh, remains of plant material, animal material, giving us clues about what people ate, what they had to eat, and etc. about 9,000 to 14,000 years old, okay? So we have the Fertile Crescent, we have all these different kinds of plants, all right? Including emmer wheat, including barley, including pea, including lentils as well, okay, including vetch, which is a forage crop, okay, that means that they, they actually have animals eating it. Animals that have been domesticated include the dog, okay, include the goat from this area, the first Fertile Crescent area, and also going to the sheep as well, all right? We're right now going to do a survey of the different plants and animals domesticated. And in East Asia, okay, including the Yellow and Yangtze River Valleys, which you talked about. Plants include rice, of course, okay, foxtail millet, broom corn millet, this is grains, yeah, uh, canola, which is used to make canola oil, hemp as well, including, you know, medicinal plant as well as um, fiber. Okay, fiber, for use as fiber, to make paper, to make cloth, OK? 
okay? Animals domesticated include cattle, include the pig, include dog, dogs, and include poultry such as ducks and chickens, okay, and geese and such. Now on another early site of agriculture, we have the New Guinea highlands, and two of the plants they have domesticated included the um, taro, also known as kalo, and banana, also known as maya, all right? Now we get to the New World, okay, including uh, Mexico, Central America, and also Peru, all right, the highlands, the South American highlands. We have squash, okay, we have corn, okay, so this, this smallest one is actually the oldest one, yeah, the one on the left, okay, corn cob from one particular dig, all right. Chili peppers as well come from the New World. Uh, an amaranth, okay, which could be a hope to ward off starvation worldwide someday. Avocado, it doesn't that look good, makes me hungry, all right. You have gourd, okay, and in Hawaii we call it ipu, all right. We have beans domesticated too in these areas, white potato and sweet potato. So we have a mystery. How did sweet potato get into the Pacific area? Nobody knows, okay. Animals domesticated in the New World include a dog and turkey, the llama, okay, isn't that interesting, a relative of the camel, that's in Machu Picu, Machu, Machu Picu, okay. This is the alpaca, source of uh, fiber, you know, wool for clothing, and the guinea pig. This is kind of sad, because I think guinea pigs are more like pets, but they actually uh, bred guinea pigs and evolved guinea pigs for meat, okay. You also have Muscovy ducks as well. Then later on, okay, in the New World, we had the tomato being domesticated, the peanut as well. So peanuts come from the New World, as well as guava. Everybody knows guava here in Hawaii, okay? Now in Eastern North America, not that many, but we had sunflower, okay? So here's a reminder that this, this structure here is not a flower, okay? It's actually a whole bunch of flowers, okay? So you can actually see the exerted uh, uh, pistol out there, the, the uh, stigmas. We have something called marsh elder, I guess used for greens as well as for its uh, seeds. And we have goosefoot, you can see the seeds there from that, okay? And also gourd as well, okay? Now domesticated plants, they tend to be very different genetically from their wild ancestors. So one thing, we humans have done artificial selection, okay, to actually mold them to what we need. So for one thing, you have corn that have husks. So corn is so uh, artificially selected that they could not survive in the wild, okay, without humans, because what would happen? The husk would cover this whole structure here, and what would happen is that the seeds would not be able to be dispersed. They'd all be crowded together all in one area, so they'd be uh, com competing with each other and not able to grow at their best way. So corn is one example of a plant that is totally dependent on humans, okay, to disperse its seeds. Another trait is that you have domesticated grasses, such as wheat and barley and etc. They have these heads that do not shatter, okay? Because generally wild grasses, the head shatters to disperse the fruits, to disperse the seeds, okay? Such as, this looks like um, barley, okay? No, maybe not, maybe that's uh, wheat. Now we also, domesticated barley furthermore, more productive, you have six rolls of grains instead of only two, okay? In wild barley, you have two rolls of grain only, all right? So of course, the centers of agriculture, their main products, the, the carbohydrate basis of the diets included the Fertile Crescent with their wheat and barley, okay? East Asia with rice, Africa, sorghum and millet, okay? And in Mesoamerica, you had corn, all right? Different kind of corn. And South America, other kinds of root crops, such as potato, which is a stem, of course, and others. So you have white potato, here you have sweet potato, and then you have cassava. Now this fellow, Nikolai Vavilov, okay, Russian person, he proposed eight centers of origin. So you can kind of take a look at this drawing inside of your textbook, okay. So this, he proposed eight centers of origin where agriculture began, okay. Very brilliant man, okay, very, uh, he was a hero. He actually died in a Soviet gulag, de defending another prisoner, okay, from the abuses of a guard. So they shot him. Anyway, so he was a real... Very strong, very, uh, really something. So he traveled a lot, so, but so his centers of origin is sort of like one of the beginnings of systematically looking for biogeography, where certain plants came from, okay? Now, but, but there are some flaws in some of his eight centers of origin. In that, 
Okay, some of the some of the crops are were domesticated more than once, such as and even dogs actually were domesticated in more than one place as well. Okay, so there are di different places they were domesticated. Others from other regions, larger regions, not just from centers of agriculture, and some others came from other places instead of the ones that Vavilov thought of. Don't forget that he was a hero, though. You know, he really was. All right. Another thing is that cotton and cassava are different kind of plants that developed independently from each other, okay, in de de depended, uh, independently developed in different places, all right? And so we have cassava and corn, uh, cotton, okay, in both Mesoamerica and in South America, separately. Okay, now what do you think? Why are crop origins important? Think of that. In the event of a famine, in the event of an infection of some kind of an important crop, think about it. What if all the rice plants, you know, that, that in the world that we only grew one type, what will happen? Okay? If you have a disease that attacks them, they'll get all wiped out. Okay? Very, very scary because famine has happened before in various regions of the world. All right, so we have to think when we, we have a crop that has shown some kind of weakness or some kind of new pest or new insect has been infesting them, what do we need? We need to go back to the source. We need to go back to the source to get plants to breed with it so we can breed more new plants that have some kind of disease resistance or resistance to insects. Okay, very important because remember, we in our modern day times, we, most of the people in the world depend only on about a dozen different crops to sustain them. What happens if something happens to them? Mass famine, starvation, terrible, terrible things. Okay, alrighty, so here we're gonna go to the summary now. All right, so to summarize, we talked about nutrition and about the idea of nutraceuticals because, of course, in our world, in the United States, many of us do have the luxury of, you know, eating for health purposes. Okay, that is a luxury. Most people in the world live, uh, eat to live, okay? Okay, now the first human societies we talked about, perhaps hunter-gatherers, foragers. We also talked about the earliest uh, settlements in agricultural regions, a little bit, okay? We talked about domesticated plants and purported centers of plant domestication, and also that the past may be the key to the future. Therefore, this is very important stuff. Food, I mean, plants as food, very, very important. Alrighty, anyway, so that sums up what we want to talk about today, and look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, hope you, you enjoyed this wild gallop, okay, through the early prehistory and history of humanity and our relationships with food. Okay, that's all for today. Goodbye.